if I speeded that up with the new um, PowerPoint that I <laughs> Actually, I ended up having to make two PowerPoints. The new one I have to, I had one that just wrote it. And I didn't want to have to take a rotation on the new one of job, so it would be easier to have two. So, um, let me just give you a few announcements. Uh, January, we won't have it until January 11th, so that's the second Wednesday. We have a special speaker, uh, Rosie Bossy is uh, speaking on her seventh book, The Road to Montana, and uh, she's a Kansas author, so, and she's done like 10 or 12 children's books also. She's going to bring all of her books, and you can buy one if you want, you can have them. She'll have her children's books and her adult books. And I can tell you that uh, Rudy Niemeyer loved that book. I'm going to read it ahead of time. He loved it. So he's a very big reader. So um, if you want to read it, we will think about reading that. We have this one, and then we'll, we'll buy the other in the series. <laughs> and then in um, February, we don't have a book, but we have the world famous Karen Lamb, who's a um, world winning musher. Her dog, and she's going to tell us about monkey and about the dog. We've always got them for the kids, but adults have never had them. So I had emailed her and said, Hey, if, if you're coming around anytime, she's willing. I'm coming in February. Can I come in February? So she was working out of the guy, Kansas. Uh, and so February is cold, great time for the dogs to come, great time for us to, to bundle up and have fun and think about her being out in the Arctic with her dog. I just thought that was a great. I don't have Wednesday. I don't have uh, March yet. I have some in April, but <laughs> um, if you have any fines at all or know anybody that has fines, uh, we're going to do fines and bring a can or a can or box things, you know, rice roni or whatever you want, peanut butter, and pay for your fine. Okay. We don't take food for lost or broken or the damaged thing, but we do for fines. And that's till um, December 13th. Okay. So, and everything has to have current dates on it. And then we just donate that to Genesis Food Bank. Okay. But I know most of you don't have fines, so I'm just telling you for other people. Okay? <laughs> um, if you know anybody who speaks an English class, whether they speak English, whether they speak Spanish or another language, we have our Spanish class going on every Thursday at 6 30. They will go till the 17th of December. And then they start at the work book in January, um, this time in January. So um, there's the work work they work from and talk, and there's about 10 people that are in the class right now. So probably 12 and about 10 come because you know how to do You have responsibilities at work, and sometimes you can't come. So we get about 10 people at a night. And then, of course, our youth activity center during the holidays will be open from one until five um, when school is out. So if you have a brand new child, nine years, nine years old, through 15, um, they can come downstairs and do some of our Legos and play computer games or um, <clears throat> do all kinds of stuff up there. And then also, as you know, uh, if you, if we have weather, You'll find on Facebook, on our website, or on our online chat blog. We'll put us an announcement that's closing be here, it'll be here, and then it'll be on the on the top border. It'll score up like okay, we're closed because of weather. So I'm not anticipating getting that much snow tomorrow or ice, but you no, know, if we do, I'll let you know. <laughs> also, don't don't forget summer Eli. So you may have gotten an email that said some sunflower e-library is going away. It's going to be Libby. It's always been Libby. They changed the name. This is for us in Kansas because we're a sunflower state. So we made our platform the sunflower e-library. But it's always been for a long time the Libby. Um, and it's got this little thing on your phone or your, on your um, you go to sign up for it. So don't get confused if somebody says this is stopping. It'll still be available. It's just under the name for the little girl. Okay. And then who Frost is here. And we did get down to three checkouts because Northwest Kansas Library System um, was $3,000 over on their budget. 
in October. So they looked at the statistics and said, okay, the most expensive ones are $299, and we won't have those. You can get three checkouts a month. Hopefully, in 2003, we'll have more checkouts. Uh, but it just got to be, we were so, we used it so much that it got to be more expensive than they expected. So um, we may have to go to So don't panic, but you, you only get three years of video. But if you have a husband or a, you know, a, a spouse or something, um, you can use theirs too. If they have the library card, they can sign up for this and you can use the book. Or you can watch a movie or you can look at comics or documentary or a TV program, whatever you want, you can do that. But you, um, you know, if someone in your family has one, you can use theirs too. Just that's another way do that. And then um, next, without further ado, I'm going to invite Rick Austin to come. He works for the Veterans Administration here in Colby and uh, the Northwest Kansas, not just here in Colby, Northwest Kansas. He did speak to us a few years ago about um, the Korean War. And so we were talking and I said, couldn't come on um, the week before Veterans Day. And so I said, darn. He said, well, how about if we talk about soldiers and Christmas? So well, he's gonna tell the story. So come on in and I'm gonna hand in the mic. Thank you. So by the way, who loved those you know, books that are being out that are costing us money and those are probably mine. <laughs> I get in my car and it's the first thing I turn on. I've also found some not good. <laughs> you can't help it. Well, thank you for allowing me to come speak. Um, my name is Rick Alton. I work for the Kansas Commission on Veterans Affairs and I work in conjunction with the VA and my job is to help veterans or veteran spouses or veteran families get what literally what they deserve. Okay. Uh, one of my best friends or is Will. Will, I think you all know. You see him up here at the library every now and then. You see him riding some of those funky library uh, bicycles around town. I have no idea how he does that with the handlebars like this. <laughs> but he figures it out. And so my job is to help veterans. And my job is also to find services for different veterans. You know, so one, one of the biggest changes in veterans uh, health from the VA is that they can now go to their local doctor here in town. And the VA pays for that. You know, so they no longer have to drive to Hayes or they no longer have to drive to Burlington to see a doctor. They can go see their doctors right here. And it has changed VA healthcare tremendously. Tremendously. Now, the clinics are upset because no one's driving to Hayes or no one's driving to Burlington. Why should they when they can go three blocks and there they are? So, if you have any questions, my office is directly west of the driver's license bureau. You can tell my office because it has a sign on it that says close. <laughs> because I travel a little bit, just a little, just a little, and um. I, I wanted to start by thanking the two lovely ladies over here who had uh, lunch with us today and said it was going to snow. And so I'm going to go home and get my sled out. <laughs> and I have a nice big dog and we're going to play mush tomorrow. Maybe. Maybe. We may have to put rollers on it, but we're going to play mush. Just because you're in the military does not mean that you don't get to celebrate Christmas. All militaries around the world, all American militaries around the world, celebrate Christmas. 
And they all do it pretty much the same way and they pretty much always done it. But I found some interesting facts about some other countries and the kind of things that they do. But let me start with one of my favorite subjects, the cavalry. When I started in the army, I was a cavalry scout. No horses. My horses were metal. And it was a Jeep. And it had a machine gun mounted up on top. And when I was going through school to become a cavalry scout, we had to learn how to shoot that machine gun while riding down the road. I don't know how anyone hits anything. <laughs> I will tell you that the, the, the young soldier who went after me, see, they're, they're held in place by a pencil. And somehow they hit, they hit a depression and it knocked that pencil out. And let's put it this way, he is infamous for taking out the windshield. <laughs> in between the driver and the drill sergeant. I mean, yes, yeah, they hit that, and, and when they came back down, the machine gun came down with them, and just to hold on, he happened to pull the trigger. <laughs> so, my claim to fame was I was in the back seat. <laughs> but I was not worried, other than the empty shells hitting me in, this, in my steel pot, going bing, 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 bing. That's not so bad. <laughs> but it did. When the cavalry, when it came Christmas time for the cavalry, they would have an all host party. The only issue was the enlisted men were not allowed to go. The party, the, the party then was only for the officers. And it wasn't until the party was over that the enlisted men could then go in and see if there was anything left. <laughs> you know, because of course they all still had to pull duty. And the, the, the enlisted men and the officers who were out in the field, you know, riding patrol, they never got to celebrate Christmas. You know, unless they were in a town, in a town that celebrated Christmas, I understand that oftentimes they would invite those soldiers in to celebrate. And they, it was usually in the saloon, and so you know how well that went. GIs and alcohol. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> you can absolutely get for that. By the way, Speaking of alcohol, when I first started this job, I was in Hayes, and we were we we had been collecting as many what we call DD two fourteens or um, uh, veterans, and when they're done with their enlistment, they get this form that says that yes, they were in service, they served honorably, they began on this date, and they ended on this date. And there was a black soldier that I found, and I was getting ready to scan his, his paperwork. It just out of the corner of my eye, I noticed something, and I said, that cannot be. He served for 21 years. He went into the cavalry when he was 42 years old. And he went in as a private. No rank, nothing. After 22 years, he retired as a private. <laughs> and yet, so reading, reading his, his papers, he had been promoted six or seven times and he, he, alcohol, that's all I got to say, alcohol. And that was, that was a big issue back then. You know, they would, they would give you rank and then it, it may take you 10 years to go from a Private one to a private two. And then they would just take it away. So 
He graduated or he retired at five and each year, making about twenty-seven dollars a month. Well, you got a free horse. <laughs> you had to count for something. So Christmas in the military, it's different everywhere you go. It's not always on Christmas Day, although we try to make it on Christmas Day. So for instance, when our troops during the Civil War, the only ones who got to go to Christmas or who got to celebrate Christmas were the ones who were not fighting. The services continued throughout Christmas Day. There was no break just for a holiday. <clears throat> but it seems as if the soldiers from the South got to celebrate much more than the soldiers from the North. Because I couldn't find anywhere where it talked about what the soldiers in the North did during the Civil War. I didn't see anything. Yet the soldiers in the South, as long as they were not engaged in a fight, they would have Christmas dinner. Now, afterwards, the soldiers who had been fighting got the leftovers. You can imagine there was not a lot of leftovers because there wasn't a lot of food, period, especially in the South. I mean, the South had been so, what's that? Oh, I was gonna say, the South had been so devastated that the majority of food that they had was what they had found to kill. You know, there, there was no nice big turkey stuff and it was whatever they got to include rats, snakes, you know, of course, the ultimate raccoon, because they taste just like raccoons. <laughs> Anybody here ever had raccoon? Look at Will. Will say, I mean, he's in the army long enough that, and I can, I can attest to that fact. There are times when I've been in the field all over the world. And they bring you food, and it's like, what? no word, what's that? I, I was almost going to cuss, I'm sorry. It's like, what, what is that? You can eat it, don't worry about it. It's fine. I will tell you a very quick story. When I was in Germany, we were in northern Germany um, on maneuvers. No American had been in that part of Germany since World War II. I mean, it, it, we were we were way up there. So we felt like small Eskimos, and uh, and we were we were doing exercises with the Danish army, and so they decided that they're going to take our breakfast and we're going to trade it with the Danes. You know, so they get our breakfast, and our breakfast consisted of eggs. Sometimes cooked, sometimes boiled. I don't understand why they were always green. You know that book, Green Eggs and Ham? Yeah, that's an army book. My soups just had a sense of humor. And so they took ours and we took theirs. And they served horse meat. That's what we got for breakfast, the horse meat. And it was, we, we could literally, we did. We picked it up and we could look through it. It was that slim. And you know, so we're not talking, you know, top of the line racehorses. <laughs> talking Uncle Joe's racehorses that were in the field and you're like, five bucks to that. <laughs> and it was, but it was very interesting. And their biggest complaint with our food is that it was way too much. They said, oh, this is too much. We can't eat all this. So we just looked at them and said, you people are stupid. Way too much. 
tell me about the very first Christmas that the military, well, let's, let's go back to this thing. There's a famous story about George Washington and Christmas for his soldiers. What did George Washington do for his soldiers for Christmas? Anyone know? Absolutely nothing. What he did do was he got them ready to go and invade and attack the British because the British were on the other side of the island, the island, island or inlet rather, and they were they were having a great Christmas party, and they had been drinking all day long. <laughs> and trust me, the British like to drink almost as much as the Americans do, almost. And so it was that night, while the British were pretty much drunk, that Washington invaded. And in three hours, the British gave up because their men couldn't fight. They were they literally they were laying about everywhere. And you know, I, I mean, I, I I can't say this from experience. <laughs> um, but they were they were too drunk to function. They had been given alcohol all day long. And so when Washington and his soldiers came across on the boats, the British couldn't do anything. Nothing at all. And that's how he won. Pardon me? They were Hessians. Oh, I thought he said they were Russians. It's like, what are you talking about, Russians? <laughs> Right. You're right. They were predominantly German soldiers. Trust me, I was born in Germany. I was stationed in Germany. I don't quite drink like a German. <laughs> but those boys know how to drink. When I was in, when, again, when I was stationed in Germany, since I spoke German, I was the representative who would go to our center unit, our German sister unit. And the first time I went there, they were loading up their vehicles to go to the field for uh, a 21 day um, field exercise. And I happened to be standing there talking to a sergeant, a German sergeant. Out of the corner of my eye, I see something that I can't believe. I look over and they're loading cases of beer into their titties. <laughs> and I looked at him and said, what are they doing? And he said, they're loading beer in the tanks. And I said, huh, are you guys allowed to take beer to the field? He says, yes, but only three weeks work. <laughs> and, they, and, and they could not drink until after, after six o'clock. So, German army after six o'clock at night, they were almost they were almost as useless as the Danish army after six of five. <laughs> By the way, the Danish army has a uh, has a union, and if they don't have duty after six o'clock, they don't. It's like they're not even in the army. They don't have to do anything. They just go in their go in their tents and sleep whatever. Anyway, during World War One. There's a famous story about the British fighting the Germans in Bella Woods in France. And on Christmas, I mean, it, it, it was horrific. That war was absolutely horrific because and I, I guess I don't understand now, but they would have to, the, the British would send way of troops over to try and get over and through the barbed wire, you know, and kill the Germans. And they'd be slaughtered. They had all these bodies laying out there. And then the Germans would try and, and attack. But on Christmas Eve day, the Germans literally flew a white flag. And, you know, they went out to talk to the British, and they said, 
It's Christmas. We want to have a ceasefire. And so they did. World War I, they had a ceasefire. And so each side was to go out and pick up their dead and take them back. Well, what happened was both sides went out together and the Germans helped pick up the British dead and the British helped pick up the German dead and or wounded and buried them and they took care of them. And they literally had this huge party. And then the next day on Christmas Day, to celebrate, they had a soccer match. We're talking in the middle of what used to be a mine field. Now, I played soccer in German field. I didn't see anything that I thought was gonna blow me up. I seen some guys who tried to kill me, but that's different. But it was during Christmas time that those that the British soldiers and, and the German soldiers came together and celebrated as one. And they celebrated because it was Christmas. At midnight on the 25th, the wartime began. This is and that's when, when they talk about the rocket's red glare, they weren't talking about the Americans. Because at midnight, artillery shells from both sides lit up the light, lit up the night sky. During World War I, the American soldiers stopped at Christmas. Of course, they still had sent sentries and guards out. But they celebrated Christmas. And the military would bring them as much food as they possibly could. It wasn't always turkey. It wasn't always stuffing. It was mainly during World War I, whatever they could find to take out there. The supply lines were very slow. I was a supply sergeant. Don't holler at me, it wasn't my fault. But the supply lines were very, very slow. And oftentimes, um, the Americans would have to eat whatever was available. And oftentimes, they ate the same thing for three and four days. And it wasn't hot. And so being in the trenches, with it raining and snowing, it's pretty miserable. But the American Army and the Navy and the Marine Corps and the Air Force and now Space Command, you know, our obligation to our soldiers is that we will celebrate every single holiday that we can. And, you know, the biggest celebration of, of the year is always the first day of whatever branch of the military you're in. I mean, everything stops on those days. It doesn't stop, but we still have guys with guard duty and MPs out thinking there's somebody. You know what? At Christmas time, each of the different branches have their own their own way of doing it. They have their own set of rules and regulations. And I kind of like the way that the British Army does it. Because the British Army on the morning of Christmas Day, the officers go in and serve key to all the enlisted men in their bunks. And they're not allowed out of their bunks until they've had their tea. You know, and so according to the, to the, the British, it's a way that the British Army proves that their officers care about their men. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But I will tell you that it's the same way that the Americans do. That for Christmas, for either Thanksgiving or for Christmas, 
The officer served all the food. Of course, he listened to his left cooking. <laughs> but the officers in their finest dress blues or dress white, dress red. Not, we're not quite sure kind of what color the Space Force has yet. But it's their it's their responsibility. And if you talk to them, it's a way that they give back to their soldiers with everything that they've done. The simple act of just serving food. You know, and if you're if you're in garrison, meaning if you are not at war, you know, the families are invited. And everyone gets to eat for free. My son, my youngest son, was deployed to Kosovo this past Christmas. And in Kosovo, there were 10 different countries. And they all had their own Christmas dinners. Yet the majority of them came to the American food line to eat because they never had it. They never had turkey and dressing and you know, coleslaw and things like that. So they wanted to try it. And I asked my son, I said, so, and then did you guys go to the other camps? He said, no, they had crap. <laughs> I said, you're a good man. Good man. Hey, go. But you know, praise the Lord, my son came home. Boy, he has some stories. And uh, I can't tell you what they are, or then I'd have to kill you. <laughs> and I don't think these knives are going to be able to do it. I'm going to have to fork it there. <laughs> and so in World War I, you know, the Americans, you know, American cooks went, up, went about and they cooked. And it's, it's what they've done in every war. And every Christmas, they would cook special for our soldiers and our sailors and our Marines. You know, even the ones who were on guard duty, who couldn't leave, you know, as soon as someone was finished eating, and no one had to tell them to do this, they would go for a place of guard and let the guard come. That's, that's the one thing about our soldiers. We care about each other. I think more than any other soldiers I've been with, except maybe the British. But we care about what happens to our soldiers. We care about that they get to be part of the festivities and the ceremonies. You know, there's the, there's the cutting of the Christmas cake by the commander with his saber. I've always asked, is that thing clean? <laughs> no one's ever. <laughs> but I never got to run, so I'm, I'm I was here. Are there any soldiers in here? <laughs> yeah, I know you. Did you ever get the runs in the army? What was I did in the Marines? <laughs> <laughs> I beg your pardon. God be a show off. In World War II, they took the food out of the soldiers. And the majority of it was ice cold. But they all got turkey. And they all got ham and they all got stuff. And they didn't care if it was freezing cold or if they were in the South Pacific, if it was wet and rainy, we made sure that our soldiers and our sailors and our airmen and our Marines we tried to get them a hot chow. Sometimes we did and sometimes we couldn't, but they didn't care. It was the fact that we, as Americans, care enough about them that we would sacrifice our own time and our own food to hand it off. So I've heard many stories about World War II, especially from my grandmother, my German grandmother, and my mother who lived through it. And 
I, I can remember my grandmother, you know, saying, so for Christmas, for Christmas in Germany, we have ham. Not ham like you and I know it, but I mean ham. The big old thick piece of thing. And my favorite, potato balls. I eat those things all day. I did once. Couldn't move. <laughs> She said, yeah, yeah, I told you not to eat so much. I said, no, you didn't. <laughs> but that's one of the things that our country does for our men and our women. We take care of her as much as we possibly can. We celebrate. Christmas, and we celebrate Thanksgiving. We celebrate Halloween by all the firecrackers going off in the air. Sometimes they land somewhere and they go off a little bit bigger. But that's what, that's what we do at Christmas time. And I have to thank all of you because it's because of you and the taxes you pay and the generosity that you give <clears throat> that our military men and women are taking care of. So thank you. During Vietnam, they ate in the rice paddies. They got what they could. Anybody here ever, ever had this, what's called a sea ration? <laughs> the sea ration? Or, you know, sea ration is a box of food about that big. MRE. No, MRE is different. Oh, MREs are in package. Oh, that, we're big time now. Yeah, now we have bags that have heaters inside them. That's the cool part. It has its own heater inside each bag. Man. You put your food in that heater. Man. I had a couple of friends I was stationed with in Germany who, when they came back to the state, they became part of a group who um, who tested those MREs. And MRE is meal ready to eat. It's in a bag. Everything you need is in the bag. I'm not sure how they get turkeys in the bag, but they do. It's in a bag, and then you put water in the bag. You're to, you take your food out. You put it in this bag and you put water in the bag and you close it. And the bag heats up by the water. Oh, yeah. That's American stuff. Those other people, other countries, they can wish it had like that. But so these two soldiers that I had become friends with, we stayed in touch. And the one, one sends me a note, he says, Hey, um, Sorry, John's in the hospital. And I asked him, I said, what, what, what do you mean? He said, he's in the hospital. What happened? He said, he ate his MRE. So for breakfast, every single one of those bags has a dehydrated potato. It looks like a big cracker, a potato. And so we would munch it on it. No, they did. Didn't think they ended up. And then he drank coffee. Uh -huh. Talk about food. <laughs> they had to take him to the hospital and pump his stomach out. <laughs> Otherwise, they said he would die. I did not feel like I went to Wisconsin in December for a few <laughs> Today, our troops are better taken care of than they would ever have been. They have better food, better clothing, better equipment. And it's all because of the love that we have for our soldiers. You know, we know that they're going to be out there and it's going to be cold. My last Christmas in the Army, I spent in Korea. I don't know why, but I did. And uh, never been so cold in my life. Never. And we, we, for Christmas, we got, we, 
were still in our barrel and we got to eat really nice, you know, and in January. And I don't understand why you always have to get to January. January and June. January, of course, in Korea is a little cold. Why do you think we go in June? What do you think happens in June in Korea? Monsoon season. And so they say, well, we're going to go out for you guys to learn how to fight in the rain. It's like, what jackass fuck is that? <laughs> anyway, thank all of you for supporting our guys and girls all over the world. You don't know how much it means to them, to us, you know, to know that the country is behind you. Of course, we have some detractors. Of course. You know? But that's what America is. America, I have two choices. Love it or you leave it. Thank you for allowing me to have been a soldier in it and to have gone what I've gone through. Because it made me a much better man than I was. Same with Will. Same with the Marines. The Marines, the few, the proud, the dead on the beach. I don't. Thank you. Have a very, very merry holiday season. Remember those less fortunate than you? Give what you can and bless whoever you can. Thank you. Do you have any questions for Rick? Any I have one question. So you were a supply sergeant. Yes, right? ma'am. So I was in charge of toilet paper. Really? How long did it take to get? Yes. Yeah. No. So I was our mess sergeant. Makes you wonder why they call him a mess sergeant. <laughs> our mess sergeant. Right. But it was carried in my supply bag. So that's what. Um, just to let you know, there are some books on the table that can be checked out for Christmas. There's some up on the reference desk that are Christmas books also, and they are ready to be checked out. Um, is there anything else I need to tell you? Okay. Well, anyone here? Anyone here who owes a fine can line up upstairs. That's <laughs> right. We can get a separate on. And it says uh, three fines, and you explain your fines, and you explain it to one, three fines. We'll give you that last year. So, Merry Christmas, and we will keep, we will see you through the year. We do have our, we'll be posting our, our hours for Christmas to be posted 23rd, 24th, 25th, and 26th, because of the way Christmas is falling. So uh, get your stuff early for those four days. And then we'll do the same for the uh, first of the year, partly because of the first of the year, and partly because of the chances of the community to be able to join the part of the community on the time. Merry Christmas. Thank you for coming. And we will see you around during those days. <laughs>